you're reviewing conversations on conflict management, a conversation with one of the world's leading researchers and authorities on conflict management, Dr. Afsal Rahim. And I'm excited about today's conversation on intragroup conflict. And I suppose that means conflict inside of a group. Yes, these are the project teams, you know, and for example, you know, project management has become very important. It is there in entrepreneurship business. It is becoming, it is there in other organizations where they are developing projects. And again, you know, the, if the group can concentrate on substantive conflict, mm -hmm. that will do, the, do a good job. But there is a project leader who should know that he or she has to think about effective conflict, how to minimize it. Uh, we don't want to waste our time. And the good relationship is, is a prerequisite for success in, in teams. Well, let's talk about those teams and formal groups a little bit because I think as an observer, I've noticed that workplaces and certainly many around here uh, are run on the basis of a team or a group rather than a department. So there's a whole lot of team stuff going on in terms of particularly stores, factories. So are you seeing the same thing, the rise in the use of teams? Yes, there are teams in, in organizations and it is, uh, it is connected, the teams are connected with each other. They have the departments, but mm -hmm. they have teams. The teams are interconnected and the final is the output of, of the team. And sometimes the CEO is working in team two, okay? And the vice president uh, for research and development is working on team three and so on. Mm -hmm. So they are in formal you know, departments, mm -hmm. but they are in teams. And it appears that this has become very important. And now, and, go ahead. Now than ever before. And project management. Project management, actually, we need to understand conflict management in projects because many projects are failing. About 20% um, they are not doing it uh, well at all. They have, they have spent their budgeted amount and they want more money and there is, so there is cost overrun and the time overrun, they cannot do it. But if you want to keep a healthy organization, a healthy team, you have to learn conflict management because there will be conflict among people. Well, let's talk a little bit about, we've talked some about formal groups and teams. What about informal groups or teams at work? Are there such things? What are they? How would we know one if we saw one? Uh, for example, some people want to play golf. Okay. They meet on weekends and play golf and do some you know, discussion, you know, <laughs> chatting. And those informal groups appear to help the organization. Mm -hmm. You know, we should encourage informal t groups. I've noticed that the proverbial uh, golf group mm -hmm. for solving things has kind of yielded to yoga and fitness and some of these, <laughs> and maybe even soccer, right? Yes. Uh, as ways that uh, people can get together away from work. Yes, they, they can even talk about their you know, issues in organizations, but this is on informal, this is outside the organization. Or sometimes, you know, it is inside the organization because some, uh, you know, employees are going for lunch together and they can discuss few things. Uh, this is a good idea. In Japanese organizations, you know, there is no union, but any, a group of workers can ask a manager to come and eat lunch with them and discuss some problems. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. So in a Japanese organization, there is all kinds of informal group discussion going on and they, they will not do like the classical organizations where I'm not going to talk to the union and after four years I will find out what it is. But in organizations, discussion is going on all the time. So if we have formal and informal groups going on at the workplace, we're going to have intra-group conflict, right? There will be conflict. And as I said, Bob, before that, stay away from effective conflict. And maybe the supervisor or the leader can make it clear at the beginning that we don't like effective conflict here. We stay away from it, show respect to your colleagues and 
supervisors um, develop some kind of trust and treat each other with respect, that, that will do it. And I think we said in an earlier conversation, uh, separate the problem from the person. Yes, absolutely. In negotiation, you are separating the individual from the problem. Like uh, North Korea thing, you know, we should not talk about that guy. People have talked about his wardrobe and his haircut. I think right. that is effective conflict. But we have some problems with, with him, uh, with, with that state, mm -hmm. and let us, uh, let us uh, do that. And so some of, the, some of the variables in the readings that have to do with predicting intergroup conflict or the style of the leader, the structure of the task. Um, but I wanted to point you towards group composition and group size. Do, do those two things uh, predict uh, conflict or how can they be better managed? I mean, are big groups harder to deal with than small groups, for instance? I remember here, I, can, I think I can talk about it. When Ransdale was here, we were selecting the uh, provost. Yes. And I told frankly that you have a group of five or seven, nine is, you know, you are pushing to. He said, no, this cannot be done. There were 16 members. I mean, yes, of the can group, you, can of the you, committee members. If all these people are interviewing a candidate, what will that be? Yes. But nine is the limit. Now there is a positive. So the magic number nine here. Yes, nine. Okay, go ahead. Um, a, you know, five, uh, nine, or three, five, nine. The, <laughs> and uh, if you go beyond nine, what happens? There will be more conflict. Okay. There will be, uh, you will be wasting more time in discussion, and it's not worth it. And when it comes to the quality of decision making, it has deteriorated. You know, mm -hmm. in, if you in large groups, the quality of the decision is not very good. Mm -hmm. But go with six. Well, one thing I've noticed that larger the department, the more likely there is to be teams that oppose one another, uh, and that smaller ones tend not to break down into uh, two different groups or opposing. There will be subgroup formation. Subgroup formation, that's a good way to think about it. Sub, there will be subgroup formation, and we don't want that. Mm -hmm. So What I am saying that it will be difficult to manage conflict with larger groups, but yeah. we should have smaller groups. You want to make a decision fast, yeah, go ahead and, and do it. One term that appears in this reading is uh, groupthink. Yes. Could you talk about that just a little bit? Because I think a lot of the books will refer back to something in the 1960s. Yes. Uh, but could you give us a current example of uh, groupthink in an organization? And the groups can be productive, okay? The teams are working hard to, you know, make the teams effective or productive and for which you know there is there could be team building for example and a good example but uh, your question is about group think group think yeah but if you have a cohesive group mm -hmm. not heterogeneous group okay actually heterogeneous groups are better yeah they have more conflict do they <laughs> they have more conflict yes and for if you are talking about creativity and innovation I think we need heterogeneous groups. Homogeneous groups, they think alike, mm -hmm. and they may fall into group think. Yes. They think that uh, they are the best, they cannot make any mistakes, and a group decision is always good. They have not done any unethical things. So there are some, some symptoms of group think, and it could be reversed if we use uh, problem solving or if we use a dialectic process, that Hegel's dialectic that was in chapter one, if we use that, then we are uh, likely to avoid groupthink. Where everybody agrees. Well, people agree with each other. Of yeah. course, you know, it has been found that some people had some things in mind, they didn't like it, but they were being intimidated that all yes. these people agreed. Yeah. And how come you are the only one you don't, you don't agree? Yeah, so it's not just homogeneity, but it also could be intimidation. Intimidation. Or lack is, of encouraging a culture of 
of questioning things. In several experimental studies, we have found that some people were intimidated to believe in something that they didn't believe. They said, how can we disagree? 10 people have said this and he was another thing, but no, if you want to counteract, you know, you should do things differently. Let me give you a political example, the Bay of Pigs fiasco. There we go. Actually, you know, after the fiasco, some of the top people were interviewed. They uh -huh. said, yeah, we had yeah. some doubts about this, but we thought that the president has made up his mind already. Right. And the president was interviewed. He said, no, I didn't make up any mind. I wanted a good decision by the team, but they fall into that group mm -hmm. think process. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people had Arthur Schlesinger, for example. Yes. He said he had doubts, but he saw all these agreements and he didn't say anything. Maybe that's what they should do. They should mm -hmm. challenge the existing, you know, you know, structure of decision making and they should you know, we should encourage uh, a little bit of deviance. Well, there are many <laughs> leaders that are very uncomfortable with being challenged. I see that all the time. All the time. So how do we get, you know, this is a practical problem. How do we get leaders to open up and know it's okay to be challenged? How can we, oh, okay. how can actually, we get there? Actually, President Kennedy learned from this fiasco. Okay. So there was the missile crisis. Yes. And... He was not present in those team meetings. He said, I will not be there, but you come up with the best solution. And they did a very good job, mm -hmm. okay? But he did not, uh, President Kennedy did not say that these are my preferred solutions. He didn't solution. signal no, his. No, he didn't signal anything. And he said that every individual in the team should be a critical thinker. Ah. So he set the tone and they had a detailed plan as mm -hmm. to how to deal with Q and Missile crisis. Yes, which is what we've been talking about here is, is uh, like the uh, iconic example of groupthink or the O-rings on the Challenger mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is another one of those iconic groupthink illustrations. Um, yeah, the Challenger example, the same thing. Group same thinking. kind of thing. People, whether it's yes man or whether it's until, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, being challenged. Uh, at, seems to at be. My, uh, I had been working at Western for 35 years, uh -huh. and I had many doubts about some decisions which are made, but I, I would don't talk because I will not go anywhere. So unless there is encouragement for diversity mm -hmm. and creativity, you know, this is going to continue, this uh, group thing. So we'll let that linger, and thank you <laughs> for viewing our conversation on conflict management, and I'm Bob Hatfield. Thank you very much.